Good afternoon. This is Michael Sturgis with Biorod Laboratories. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to attend today's presentation by Dr. David Mishka. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. This session will be recorded and available for playback, so if you have colleagues who are not able to attend, they will be able to attend this presentation. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. You are welcome to submit questions anytime during the presentation using the text chat feature up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Mishka. Dr. Mishka is the founder and director of the University of Utah Center for Biomolecular Interaction and Analysis, and also the manager of the Markey Center. Dr. Mishka has been very instrumental in advancing the interpretation of biosensor data. He is the author of an analysis program known as CLAMP, and this has been downloaded thousands of times by researchers worldwide. Dr. Mishka is also a founding member of the Molecular Interactions Research Group within the Association of Biomolecular Research Facilities, otherwise known as ABRF. Dr. Mishka. Um, and also thank them for really the opportunity to work with the Proteon system um, early on and gain some uh, experience with that. And what I hope to do today is to share that information uh, with you. Um, so as a brief outline, um, what I'll talk about is since the instrument's new, I'd like to give you kind of a tour of the of the system itself. And we've already had a few questions come in about how the mechanics of, of the unit operate, so I'll try to address some of those. Um, then I'll talk about the mobilization process, and I think there's some interesting opportunities here uh, along the lines of a mobilization which are afforded by the way this instrument operates. And uh, what I'll show is this concept of one-shot kinetics, which is a relatively new concept in molecular interaction analysis as applied to biosensors, and I'll show you how I think that's really going to improve our um, ability to, to test different systems and as well as improve throughput. And then finally, I'll show some examples of doing small molecule studies uh, with the technology. Most of the data I'm actually going to present today was recently published in an analytical biochemistry article. Uh, so if you're interested, you can go and uh, download that uh, article in volume 358. Uh, um, I do want to thank and acknowledge um, members from BioRad at Haifa in Israel who put a lot of effort into uh, into helping collect the data that I'm going to present today. And I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, Joe Papalia, who works in my group, um, who helped assemble the reagents and really um, prepare these um, this model system that's, that's come in handy to test a number of different sort of applications, and I'll be discussing that as we go along. So if you walk up to the Proteon uh, instrument, um, the main thing that will strike you as being different about this technology as to a lot of currently available technology is the fact that it's a 6 by 6 parallel processing instrument. It can basically be broken down into three sort of main components. Uh, there's a chip loader region, uh, there's a sample uh, block and um, injection uh, syringe located in the, in the center of the instrument, and then there's a buffer compartment on the right. If you looked inside the sample compartment, what you'd see are these six needles for sample handling, and the instrument can, can accommodate samples as small as 25 microliters to as large as 500 microliters in a single injection. And really, partly what dictates the, the size of the injection is going to be how much you want to inject, but also the fact that there are going to be air bubbles interspersed between the running buffer and your sample. And a number of air bubbles can be controlled. One air bubble uh, will take less volume of sample, um, but it'll give sort of less clean data, if you will. So typically, we run with three uh, air bubbles uh, inter interspersed for every sample. Uh, the unit can accommodate samples in different formats. What I've shown in this figure is that it can hold two 96-well plates. Uh, these happen to be deep well plates. It can hold standard plates as well. It can also hold a, a aluminum block uh, that can hold, I think, a, well, I can't remember the exact number, but it can, it can hold a, a one and a half mil epidur 
Eppendorf type tubes uh, for samples as well. The other nice feature of the sample compartment is that the the um, the samples can be temperature controlled. So there's an aluminum uh, plate that the samples sit on, and that can be cooled to two degrees or raised up to 35 degrees if you want to. Um, and that's all done uh, internally. There's no external um, uh, like water bath or anything to do that. So if we looked at the sample compartment, uh, it can hold two different buffers. Um, and actually, what's, what's nice about the unit is that there's analog controls for buffer priming, as well as software controls. But uh, we find that the analog controls are really convenient uh, because it allows you to interact with the machine a little bit more directly when you're changing a buffer. Uh, you just push a button and it'll prime that buffer. And the fact that there's two buffers, usually one we keep with water, and we use that with, to rinse the machine before we put any uh, or take any chip out of the, out of the instrument. Uh, so it's just convenient to have that ability to select between a running buffer, let's say, and, and a washing buffer or, or water. If we went around to the right side of the machine where the syringe system is located, what you'd see is that there's actually 12 syringes, six that drive buffer, and it can run at flow rates of 25 to 200 microliters per minute, and then there's another six set of syringes that will pick up samples uh, and introduce those onto the sensor surface. Chip loading, uh, there's an automatic sort of chip loader. Um, the, the chip that's shown here, you can see there's a barcode uh, in the front of the chip, so the instrument can read that and it'll assign data to that chip. And that's really convenient if you pull a chip out and you put it back in the machine, say a week later, all that information can go into the same files. There's an analog control button for the chip changer as well as an, an automatic uh, software controlled one. But again, we the analog feature is sort of nice. There's a couple kind of surfaces. Um, I won't go into too much detail on them, but there's a chip. The, the one that's being loaded here is it called a GCL chip. Uh, it has a polymer surface, but when you immobilize protein, the density is typically more of a monolayer of protein that gets immobilized. Then there's also another chip called a GLM, which has higher capacity and it's more of an extended uh, sort of polymer surface so you can pack more proteins on there. So most of the data I'm actually going to show today has been collected off of this GLM chip because uh, a lot of what I'm going to show you is, is small molecule work where we need higher capacity in order to see those small analytes. Once you insert the chip in the machine, there are six flow channels that are automatically going to dock down onto the sensor chip surface. And again, what's nice is that during the immobilization process, we can immobilize in parallel now. So we can test different immobilization conditions and all the sort of standard chemistries that we've been using for you know, the past 15 years can be applied to these chip surfaces as well. So we can do amine coupling, carboxyl coupling, uh, thiol, and, and aldehyde coupling. And I think what's going to be nice about the technology is that because you can do things in parallel, it'll sort of encourage you to try more mobilization methods instead of just doing amine coupling and going with whatever you know sort of worked. Um, you have an opportunity to do in the same sort of experiment test multiple kind of chemistries and then pick the one that gives you the ideal response. You can also do different um, ligand uh, mobilization densities, and that's something I'll show uh, later on where we can just test and see. Because um, in some cases, you may want a high density surface, and, and for the same system, you may also want a low density surface. And so by doing it in parallel, I think it's really going to speed up uh, that whole process. If you could look inside the chip, um, inside sort of what the detector might be seeing, is sort of what's shown on this chip image slide. And so what you would see after a mobilization are these six sort of lanes of ligand surfaces. So protein has been immobilized uh, in a uniform sort of distribution down these channels. And the different 
intensities of grayscale that I've shown here would sort of represent different amounts of protein or ligand immobilized. You might think that, uh, that the higher density uh, immobilization would give you sort of a darker spot. And that's kind of what the SPR detector is seeing in these instruments as it's monitoring the light intensity that's coming off of this surface. So then the fluidic pack pass will automatically undock and then automatically rotate and redock onto the sensor chip surface. So if you went and if you could image that surface at that point, what you would see is that now you have six flow channels running horizontally across the chip. And within each channel, there's going to be a reaction spot. So that with six chan with six reaction spots in each channel, that gives you a 36 spotted array. In between each of the reaction spots now is a reference spot. So these would be regions where no protein has been immobilized, and we can use those regions to do internal referencing to correct for bulk refractive index changes or nonspecific binding. But we're not restricted only to using those reference spots. We could also set up the experiment where one of the channels itself can be used as a reference. So you could, say, immobilize some non-interacting protein in the fourth channel, and you could use that as a reference. And it doesn't have to be necessarily the fourth channel. It could be any of the channels could be used uh, as a reference. And all that assignment can be done later in, in the data processing and analysis phase. So this concept of one-shot kinetics is, is really what's new and, and afforded by this technology. And um, what it involves is, is taking the analyte and testing it at multiple concentrations, but doing it all simultaneously. So in this case, we could have six concentrations of analyte that are injected through the six channels, and they're seeing now six different reaction spot surfaces. And then during the washout phase, we collect also the dissociation information from all those spots simultaneously. So if we look now, I'm trying to show you where the data are coming from. In this first channel, you can see I've, I've numbered from one to six for the reaction spots. And those correspond to the sensogram shown on the bottom left panel. So the highest concentration of analyte, 100 nanomolar, is going to give the highest response at position 6. And the lowest concentration of 0.37 nanomolar is going to give the smallest response. Now, the data are being collected from different spots, and they're sort of being um, collated together during data analysis. Um, I mean, what's unique is that each of the different analyte concentrations while they're going over a separate spot, that spot was created at the same time during the immobilization process. So each of these density spots has the same capacity. And that's really what allows us to now do this one-shot kinetics, that you can collect data virtually from the same spot uh, for different analyte concentrations. The advantage, really, this is twofold. One is speed. Um, so now we're collecting all six analyte concentrations simultaneously. And in this case, we're actually doing it across five different ligand surfaces and one reference surface. Uh, and the second advantage is that there's no regeneration required. Um, so we don't have to regenerate the surface in order to test a different analyte concentration. And that, of course, is really critical for a number of systems. We've had ligands that are very sensitive to regeneration conditions. Uh, you can immobilize them, and they're fine, they're active, but if you try to regenerate them, they lose activity. Um, and then we've also had ligands that bind very tightly to an analyte, and it's difficult to get that analyte off the surface without damaging uh, the ligand itself. So this is a way of having the, allowing you to bypass regeneration altogether. And I think, ultimately, that's going to help with a lot of systems that we study. It doesn't mean that you can't regenerate, um, because in the system, it's possible to do multiple series of, re of, of injections, and you can bring in a regeneration condition if you wanted and regenerate the surface. And I'll show you an example of doing that. So regeneration can be particularly important for something like antibody screening. Um, 
So what I've shown here is that we've got a sensor chip that's been pre-coded, say, with some capturing agent like an antibody against a mouse. And what we're going to do is inject uh, mouse antibodies and, let's say, screen them. So we're going to inject six different antibodies at one time with the flow cells in a vertical direction. So here are actually six sensograms now for five different antibodies, and then uh, in the sixth flow cell, actually, it was a control. No antibody was injected. And what you see is, is, is that there's different levels of capture that are occurring in the different flow cells, and that's because the concentration of antibody in those hybridoma preps is slightly different, so you're going to have different capture levels. But within the blue box, the capture level within a particular flow cell is very consistent, and that's, again, because the antibody is being captured in this vertical direction um, sort of during the immobilization where you're getting the same density of antibody at each of the positions in the flow cell. Now, if I zoom in on um, the second flow cell, just to show you this region, uh, what you see is that the difference here between now this six spots within this flow cell is really less than 2%. And again, this is sort of what I'm referring to, that in this channel, when we're looking at six different positions along that channel, and we see very little variation in the amount of antibody that's been captured. And that's going to allow us to go back and do uh, this one-shot kinetics, because we're able to combine data between these spots. So again, the instrument will rotate uh, the flow cells, and we can do something like inject the antigen. do an antigen concentration series like we would do uh, normally. And then what I'm just pointing out again is that there's internal reference spots. So there's a reference uh, before and after each of the antibody spots in that channel. So now what I'm showing is the data for uh, five different concentrations of the antigen injected over these five antibody surfaces and comparing that to the control. So the bottom right-hand corner, you see there's no binding of the antigen when there's no antibody present. Um, the top three antibodies all happen to have roughly similar affinities. It's probably not too easy to see the actual values, but they're all around a three nanomolar in affinity. They all have very similar dissociation rates. You can see with the green arrow, um, they're all dissociating at about the same time. And if we compare that now to antibody four and five, you can see that the dissociation rate is much slower for these antibodies. Um, in fact, they're very similar with one another. But the association rate uh, the uh, on rate for antibody 4 is, in fact, faster than the on rate for antibody 5. So just from visually inspecting the data, we can, we can gleam a lot of information about how these antibodies are comparing in their, in their binding response to antigen. So in the end, we, we might select antibody 4. That's the highest affinity binder. In this case, it was 400 picomolar under these conditions. So when we think about um, throughput in this kind of antibody screening assay, so we're also doing regenerations. Um, so so once, we, once we capture the antibody on the surface uh, for this set of experiments, the capturing time uh, for the whole, um, that whole uh, part of the experiment is about three minutes per cycle. Uh, the chip rotation itself takes about 90 seconds. And then the antigen test, in this case, was about 30 minutes. And the main reason for that is we wanted to collect enough dissociation information uh, that we could discern the off rate for these high affinity antibodies. So we uh, collected about 30 minutes of, of, uh, of that dissociation. So at the end of that dissociation, the surface is stripped. In this case, we used the phosphoric acid regeneration. And then we go back and capture another panel of antibodies, turn the chip, and test antigen, and again, all of this is computer controlled. So once you set up the method to run that cycle, it'll do that automatically. This slide is sort of trying to show um, the level of throughput that you could expect, say, in a 24-hour period 
uh, running this kind of parallel processing. So at the far end of the uh, cycle time, if, if we said, let's do just a 24-hour experiment, and we may sometimes do this where we immobilize an antibody and we test antigen dissociation for up to 24 hours. In that case, we could do six samples in 24 hours. Uh, the example that I just showed you was where we have a cycle time of about 30 minutes. We're able to do about 288 samples in a 24-hour period. So that's three uh, 96 well plates. If we cut that cycle time, say, to 12 minutes, we'd be up to about 700 samples in 24 hours. And if we cut that cycle time down to six minutes, we're really getting up to, to the level of 1,500 samples uh, in a 24-hour period. So there's a potential here to have a really high throughput. Now these short sort of assay times, the cycles of, of, of six minutes or even less, are particularly important if we're doing screening of, say, small molecules. And that was one of the early applications we were interested in, in testing out. So we took one of our favorite model systems, which is carbonic anhydrase, and we immobilized it at six different densities uh, on the chip surface, five actually with protein, and then the sixth channel we left uh, completely blank as, a, as another reference. Just to show you the immobilization um, process, so this is all done on this GLM chip, this medium density chip. And the first step here uh, is the activation. And we're actually activating with uh, EDC and a mixture of sulfo NHS, not plain NHS. And in order to create different density spots of protein, we find that it's most convenient to just dilute the activating reagent. So we're actually doing something like a five-fold dilution series of the activation reagent. Uh, and then in position two, we're coupling the carbonic anhydrase. And at three, we're blocking with ethanolamine. So that at the end of the whole um, immobilization phase, you can see in the different channels, we end up with different amounts of protein immobilized. So now when we take one of our small molecules, in this case, uh, this compound CBS has a molecular weight of about 200 Daltons, inject that over the surface, uh, what we see is, is, first of all, interpretable binding responses, which is great. Um, and we see the response level is going down across the chip. And that's actually what we expect because we've immobilized the highest density in flow cell 1 and uh, onwards down the chip. So that's actually good. Um, the red lines represent a global fit of the data. And in this case, we're, we're globally fitting um, all the data from the chip surface. So within a lane, and across the chip. So five different surface densities of carbonic anhydrase uh, are being fit simultaneously. And this is sort of another way of, of um, demonstrating that this concept of, of one-shot kinetics can actually work. So not only does it work uh, within the given lane of a mobilized protein, but it, you can globally fit um, data sets that are collected at different densities. In the real world, what we might want to do, or ideally what we would be doing, is not immobilizing the same protein at different densities, but perhaps six different proteins. If you were doing uh, screening, say, against kinases, you might have a couple kinases uh, that you want to compare uh, for selectivity assays. This next slide shows um, the binding responses for nine different compounds. These are all sulfonamide uh, inhibitors of carbonic anhydrase. Um, the smallest one that's shown in this data set, uh, uh, benzene sulfonamide, has a molecular weight of about 157 Dalton. So it's a pretty small compound, but yet we can still pick up uh, good binding responses for that compound. You'll see there's a, there's a difference in kinetics across this array of compounds. Uh, this first compound is sulfuride. It has a fairly fast dissociation rate. The half-life of, of that interaction is sort of on, on the order of like 0.5 per second. Um, some of these other compounds, you can see the dissociation is a little slower. 
uh, furosemide, which is in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see has a has a much lower dissociation rate. So one way to look at the kinetics from that analysis is to do a, a distribution plot. So in this case, uh, we're looking at the association rate plotted versus the dissociation rate. And what you end up with are these diagonal dashed lines which represent binding isotherms. So you can go from a, a weak affinity of 100 micromolar, in this case, to a higher affinity around 10 nanomolar. So the data sets, the colored dots here, represent uh, the results from testing. Uh, in this case, I think there were 9 or 10 of these sulfonamide inhibitors. They were tested over five different densities of the carbonic anhydrase, and then the entire experiment was repeated four times. So we ended up with, a, with about 20 different data sets. Um, and what we're just showing is the distribution of the results uh, for each of those compounds. So compound A, for example, has a, an affinity of near, say, 150 micromolar. Um, and there's just sort of a spread in the kinetics in both the association and dissociation rate, which is not unexpected. And what you see for compound C is that the distribution is much tighter. And that's because compound C, there's, there's more kinetic information. Um, compound A was sulfuride. It was the one that had the very fast dissociation rate. So there's less information inherently in that data set. A compound H and I, you, you notice that there's a sort of a more of a spread in, in the data sets again. And this spread is coming from the fact that these two compounds have very fast association rates. You can see that they're above 10 to the 6th per mole per second. And so they're starting to become influenced by mass transport. And because of that, defining the on rate and off rate uh, as as precisely becomes more difficult, and that's why the data get a little bit more spread uh, in them. And this is not unexpected. The next thing we wanted to do was to validate that the information we're getting off the, the proteon instrument is, is reliable. So what you're looking at here is a comparison of the affinities um, determined either by ITC, so a solution-based method, uh, versus compared, uh, determined off of proteome, which is considered a su surface-based method. And so if the data points fall on this diagonal, it means that the affinities match. And so basically we're not seeing a difference uh, whether we collected this affinity information purely in solution or uh, off the surface-based uh, method. And there's still a lot of um, skepticism out there in the uh, in the general scientific community uh, about these surface-based methods, if they're reliable or not. So here's another example of where we don't see a difference whether we make this measurement in solution or make it on the surface. The instrument can operate, um, the detector area can operate from a temperature range of 15 to 40 degrees, so we wanted to test uh, the, the temperature dependence of some of these interactions. So what you're looking at are just three of these sulfonamide inhibitors uh, tested from 15 to 35 degrees. And what you see is that the off rate or the dissociation rate is getting faster as we go to higher temperature. And that's, that's typical for a protein ligand interaction, so that's not unexpected. A nice way of looking at the temperature dependence is to, again, plot plot them on this two-dimensional kinetic plot. Um, and so what you see are the results for four of these compounds. So for compound A, there's actually a change in the association and dissociation rate as you go from 15 to 35 degrees. But there isn't very much change in the affinity. So there's sort of a compensating effect that the on rate is getting faster at higher temperature, but the off rate is also getting faster. So the red arrow that I've drawn here is, is nearly parallel to the dotted line, the 100 nanomolar, uh, micromolar dashed line. Um, the other three compounds show a little bit more temperature dependence in that the affinity changes. It gets a little weaker as you go from 15 to 35 degrees. Um, but it's, it's also just a nice illustration to, to remind people that while we talk in terms of rate constants, rate constants are not 
uh, constant. I mean, they're dependent on experimental conditions like temperature and, and buffer conditions, of course. Um, the data for the blue compound D, uh, the light blue and the dark blue, it's actually the same compound that was studied in two independent experiments. So we're just showing sort of the reproducibility of that of that thermodynamic run. So any new technology is, is always sort of being compared with, with older technology or current technology. And so um, this slide is showing a comparison of the results for assaying uh, these same compounds on the proteon system and com comparing that to, uh, to a Viacor uh, or actually a number of, of Viacor systems um, in, that are displayed on the y-axis. So the data for this from the BIACOR experiments is actually coming from a, a benchmark study that we recently completed, and uh, it's published in Analytical Biochemistry. I think it's out in this current volume. Uh, so you, if you're interested in, um, in looking at how reproducible experiments are across platforms, it's a really good paper that uh, goes into that in, in more detail. But uh, the purpose of showing the data in, in this case is, is to show that the affinity and the kinetics really are similar whether we made the measurement on the proteon instrument or we, whether we make it uh, on this BioCore platform. And that's, that's to be expected. I mean, both instruments are, are measuring the same sort of property. Uh, so it's not uh, unanticipated that we, we would see this correlation. But it's something that people are always asking. Finally, just want to mention one last sort of a small molecule example, um, which is looking at the binding of, of compounds to protein, in this case, uh, serum albumin. And so we've immobilized the serum albumin on the sensor surface, and we're trying to determine the affinity of the interaction for a couple compounds. The challenge in working with albumin is that there's multiple binding sites uh, for a typical compound. and uh, Usually, a compound will, will bind with high affinity to a single site, but uh, will bind much weaker at multiple sites. Historically, we've done a lot of work in sort of developing assays around this kind of application. And I just wanted to show some data here. Um, the left panel shows, uh, the top one shows the binding of warfarin, and the bottom one shows the binding of naproxen, a concentration series. This is a two-fold dilution series uh, for each of those drugs. Uh, interacting with the with the albumin surface, and then the right hand panel is showing uh, an equilibrium analysis of those data. Uh, and so what you can see is that the smooth curve really doesn't describe the data uh, very well. And this again is not unexpected because there's actually multiple binding sites uh, on albumin for both of these drugs. If we add in a, a two site model, uh, we can describe these these equilibrium data very well. And out of, out of that analysis, we can actually extract affinities for this high affinity site. Uh, for warfarin, we got an affinity of about 2.7 micromolar, and naproxen was 2.1 micromolar. And all this is very consistent with the literature. Um, these affinities are are um, are really spot on with with what uh, has been reported in the past. So this is just another uh, example of of the potential to look at small molecule uh, interactions with. Uh, with the proteon system. So just a, as a quick summary, um, I think the key thing is the parallel processing. Now we're able to look at uh, six samples uh, at a time, and it's really going to uh, speed up speed up the whole analysis process. It's possible to do standard immobilization. So by standard, I mean the chemistries are basically similar to what's currently uh, currently being utilized. You can use capturing steps, as I've shown, for the antibody work as well. The parallel processing also opens up this opportunity to do one-shot kinetics. And I think this is really going to be a significant uh, advance and allow us to look at systems that are really difficult to look at because they're normally hard to regenerate um, or they may be unstable uh, to begin with. Small molecule analysis is certainly going to be a possibility with the system, um, along with the standard kind of protein or macromolecular uh, work. I mean, in, in, 
com comparison to sort of serial processing instruments, I think uh, the the sample time is really going to improve uh, by a fold by, by a factor of uh, six to thirty six fold, depending on how you know the assay is set up, and that can be considerable. Uh, finally, uh, if you're interested more in, in the work we're doing at the University of Utah, you're welcome to come to our, our website. I think a lot of you know that we, we host uh, or organize biosensor workshops, usually uh, annually. Uh, and this year, we're looking to probably have one around January, end of January. The snow's already been uh, coming down quite nice, so that will give us an opportunity to uh, take advantage of some of the better things Salt Lake City has to offer. And I, you can come to the Biosensor Tools website for information on that workshop. Uh, finally, there's a we're thinking about doing another benchmark study, um, perhaps a global benchmark study where we send reagents out and uh, it'll be more blinded and then ask groups to really um, apply their, their skills and, and try to analyze uh, the, the system. And there'll be information on that on either or both of these websites uh, once that's been uh, once we initiate that. Oh yeah, being a long time uh, a graduate student from Ohio State University, I wanted to mention Go Bucks, uh, beat Michigan again. And finally, I, I need to acknowledge and thank the NSF for their support and as well as the NIH. And um, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mishka, for your presentation. Uh, we will now take questions. Uh, please submit your questions via text chat. Uh, I will go and communicate these to Dr. Mishka, and he will go ahead and answer them for you. We'll pause for a moment while people formulate their questions. Okay, uh, Dr. Mishka, our first uh, question comes from Tony. And the question is, can you elaborate on the SPR detection? OK, so I want to make sure I'm still on. Yeah, so can I elaborate on the SPR detection? So um, I think some items that might be of, uh, of interest or um, to elaborate on. So the detection range can go up to uh, 40,000 RU. Um, the the signals that I've been showing are are calibrated into RU, so the standard units that were um, uh, interest uh, used to working in. Uh, again, the range is up to 40,000. The signal to noise is about one RU um, under sort of standard operating conditions. Um, okay. And uh, another question uh, comes in uh, related to the, uh, I believe it's the uh, spot dimensions. So what are the uh, chamber or channel dimensions? Uh, I don't know if you have that information available. Yeah, I don't know if I have it in, in, in detail. Um, the spots themselves are going to be on the order of several hundred microns that are being uh, in, interpreted. The channel. Um, height is something that is probably on the order of maybe a couple hundred micron as well, 200 micron. But don't um, hold me to that. Um, that may be something we can ask the BioRad um, uh, tech support for more information on. Okay, wonderful. Uh, next question comes in from uh, Klaus, and he would like to know, is it possible to use six different buffers in parallel? Um, it theoretically is possible, and it, while the instrument hasn't been technically designed to do that, uh, when I first saw the um, the platform, I, I I sort of was asking the same question, and it would not be too difficult to uh, take the buffer feed um, lines and feed them in, instead of coming from one buffer, we could probably end up hooking them up to feed to six different buffers, but I would. You may want to ask the 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 service rep for the instrument just to make sure that that's done and um, and doesn't void any sort of warranty. But it's something we're interested in trying because I think there's there's definitely an advantage to being able to do that. So um, 
it will be something we'll do in the future. Okay, excellent. Thank you. A uh, question related to the uh, Beacore system versus the Proteon XBR system. So when you compare to Beacore, have you tried high affinity ranges like uh, 50 to 500 picomolar? We we have collected some antibody uh, binding uh, data where the affinities have been in the 100 picomolar range off the proteon instrument. And where I think what it boils down to is um, how stable is the baseline for a, a given period of time. And so the longest we've looked at the baseline has really been on the order of a couple hours. But because you have this internal referencing, it would be possible, I think, to get baselines that are stable enough to do this kind of high affinity analysis really out to probably 24 hours. I mean, partly it's going to depend on you know how much signal you have, uh, so it's going to work better for macromolecular interactions. But um, but I, I don't think there would be uh, any problem in getting down to uh, you know the tens of picomolar range likely uh, because again you have this internal referencing. Uh, question from Albert related to the flow rate of, of in sample consumption of the system. So, what are what's the slowest flow rate you're able to uh, achieve with this with this particular system? Yeah, so the slowest flow rate is 25 microliters per minute, and the largest volume is about 500 microliters. So from there, we can calculate the longest sort of association time. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, let's see, if, uh, another question. Oh, okay. Uh, can you think of any reason why the different flow rates, uh, the same analyte in the same spots, would influence the R max? Uh, this, I'm not would sure like I understand. understand. Yeah, <laughs> repeat the question. Okay, I'll go ahead and repeat this. Um, is there any reason why different flow rates, uh, parentheses, same analyte, and, the, and to the same spots would influence the R max? Okay, yeah. Um, so there shouldn't be a reason why changing the flow rate would change the R max unless when you're doing different flow rates, unless unless mass transport is is making it um, appear like you're not reaching the R max. In other words, if you saturated the surface, um, you would sat if you if you saturate it at 25 microliters per minute or saturated it at 100 microliters per minute, those values would be the same. If you're doing um, if you're doing if you're um, extrapolating what the R max is when you haven't reached saturation, then under at different flow rates, you may end up perceiving that there's a different R max, and that would relate to mass transport. Feels like a defense question. Did I pass? David, uh, next question comes, have you done any work with binding the protein to the chip and then having the antibody sample as your analyte? We have not tried binding the the antigen to the chip and flowing antibody. Uh, that's something that we we often avoid just because of avidity effects. But we're we're more interested in screening antibodies from from crude preparations, and so we can take advantage of the ability to capture out the antibody of interest, put it on the surface, and then flow antigen. Um, and when you've got the antibody on the surface, you don't need to know its concentration anymore during the analysis. So it's a much better way of screening. Okay. Well, we'll pause and see if there are any uh, additional questions. 
Okay. Well, if there are no additional questions, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's session. As I said, the session will be recorded, so it will be available for playback either to yourself or if your colleagues were unable to attend and are uh, interested in attending. Oh, excuse me, one last one last question. Uh, question is, how do I decide what is used as an analyte? How do you decide what to use as an analyte? There are um, a number of criteria that uh, you would need to consider. Um, valency is certainly one. Um, purity is another. Um, concentration. Um, so size. So there's a number of, of issues that really relate to deciding which, which molecule you want to put on the surface. Um, if you've got two proteins that are you know, that are both monomers, then you can often do the experiment in both both orientations, put each of them on a separate surface and test each of them in solution. For things like antibody screening, we tend to like to put the antibody on the surface, as I mentioned, to avoid avidity effects, but also we have really good ways of, of, of getting antibodies down. We can capture them. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that needs to go into deciding what, what and how you're going to put put something on the surface and I think it really just depends on uh, on what's available at that time and um, if both can be done and we'd encourage you to try with both um, orients on the surface and maybe that's another point that I should mention that while the proteon instrument is always going to be running six samples at a time you don't necessarily have to use all six channels so you could set up an experiment where you immobilize just one protein on channel one and turn the chip and do an analysis of that protein, and then you can go back and you can immobilize a different protein on channel two. Um, so you don't have to use all the channels during the immobilization uh, process itself. And I think this is also good because it may encourage us to do more of the experiments uh, where we immobilize each of the binding partners, uh, you know, one at a time and, and test them out because you now have, have the chance to do six of these uh, on a single chip, and and, um, and and maybe that will give us a little bit more flexibility. Hey, uh, another question is: uh, Do you uh, reuse the chips numerous times? Um, and uh, if so, how are you storing them between uses? Yeah, so we uh, will often reuse chips that have general caption reagents. So if we have a protein A chip that we've created or an anti-human uh, antibody chip, uh, what we'll do is we'll regenerate that before we take it out of the instrument. We'll often, um, we'll often wash the, the, the system with water, then pull the chip out, and, uh, and usually we just store that. And, and these chips are a little bit larger, so we've been storing them in sort of Ziploc bags so that there's a little bit of water in the in the baggie itself so that there's a little humidity uh, around that chip. Um, and then we've been able to reuse those chips, put those back in the instrument, and, and they'll capture antibody again fine. The lifetime of the chip really, of course, will depend on, on the stability of the ligand. Um, but for some of these things like protein A, you can often uh, reuse these chips on a number of occasions. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I see no other questions. Uh, we at BioRad would like to thank uh, Dr. Mishka for taking the time to uh, give this presentation. Uh, please go and contact your local BioRad representative. We'd be very happy to help you. Thanks so much, everybody, for attending.